Well, I'm going to get started. Um, we have Annie with us tonight, and I'm just thrilled. I first met Annie um, virtually through the movie Walking, to, um, Walking the Camino, Six Ways to Santiago. It was the first time that I ever saw Annie. And somehow through this pandemic, <laughs> uh, due to the communities that she has started, I have gotten to know her a lot better. And I've told her many times, she's probably getting embarrassed at this point, but I've told her many times that uh, she's really helped me through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. The author calls that she has hosted on Saturdays have been a uh, lifeline for me and has helped me to create a little more community during this time, and I've loved it. Um, so Annie, of course, was profiled in Walking the Camino Six Ways to Santiago, and she was also co-producer, which is so exciting. So we'll be asking her questions about that. She most recently made a new documentary about the Camino called Phil's Camino. And I think a few of you have seen that, probably all of you. Um, so we'll be talking about that. And then also Annie is also an author, as if that's not busy enough, right? So she has a book and I love the size of it. You can fit it right in your rucksack. And I think this book is fantastic and we'll talk more about it, but I wanted to open up the call and just share a little bit of a passage. If you have the book with you, you can follow along with me, but the reading I'm gonna share is from day 18. It starts with a quote, we would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. Nanny says, the doctor told me to rest for five to seven days and I rested for two, actually less. I just spent two nights in Burgos, arriving one afternoon and leaving first thing in the morning two days later. I can look back now with love and compassion shaking my head. Did I really prefer being ruined to being changed? Because for me to stop and get the rest I needed, I had to change. I was afraid of losing my friends. In fact, I dreaded losing my Camino friends. I had grown so close with some of the other pilgrims that I was afraid to stop while they walked on. I thought I had come all this way to meet them and they were somehow the key to my Camino. My idea, illusion, of how my Camino was supposed to look was so strong, I couldn't even see how I was missing it. Uh, she goes on to uh, share a few more words about that, but I'll let her speak to that. And, this particular passage really stands out to me because during the pandemic, I've had to let go of quite a few things of how I thought my year was going to go. And so I have turned back to this particular day's reading several times uh, since I got Annie's book. So Annie, I just wanted to start out and let you say hi to everyone officially. And I, you are muted, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, if you'd want to say hi, and then I thought maybe if you could just share with us a little bit about what was going through your mind that day? And then when you actually sat down to write the book, what came to mind? And then how does this passage maybe fit for you right now today? Yeah, well, thank you, Lee. And thank you for such great hospitality. Lee and Corey have been so welcoming and it's really been very nice. And thanks all of you for taking time and, uh, sitting at this table together. I mean, there's, there's so much that we can get when we come together. So I appreciate that. Um, this, uh, this idea of I'd rather be ruined than changed, it's, it, it is something that's quite topical right now because when we think we have a choice, sometimes we will choose not to change. But then there are times and the Camino, you know, will give you what you need, not necessarily what you want. And I, I knew I was supposed to rest for my body's sake. And I overrode that. And what happened was my body eventually won out and I had to stop. Um, but I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't give up this idea that I was really a fit person and I can do this. And, and also I had to face losing the people that I had grown so close with. I didn't know then how in and out the Camino is. You, you see someone, then you might not see him for three weeks and then you put your stuff on the top bunk and look down and there they are. 
you know? <laughs> and I, but I didn't know that then. And so I thought the end was the end, you know? They walk further, that's the end. I'm not gonna be with that person anymore. And I think ultimately that's my fear of death. I think I had to confront my fear of death. I had to confront this idea that people are gonna walk on without me. Either they're gonna die or I'm gonna die. And that's just going to happen. But either way, we're gonna be separated. And I thought that was horrible. So that was a big lesson for me on the Camino to confront my fear of death. And this was a part of it. This was a piece of it. The fact that what I, what I was so consumed with fear and longing when I was watching my friends walk away, I couldn't see like they're going on to a great adventure. Why would I ever want to prevent them from doing that? Um, they're, they're getting what they need while I get what I need. And maybe we'll be together later and maybe we won't. And how sweet it'll be and how sweet our memories are. You know, there's just no losing when you look at it that way. But when you look at it as I want what I want right now with the people that I've decided are the people, then there's just suffering, you know, and that's the same with death. You know, I, I don't want certain people to die that have actually died in my life. And I don't want my husband to die and I don't want my neighbors to die. And, you know, all, the list is long, right? But I think that this lesson in, that happened in, started happening in Burgos and continued throughout the Camino was super important when my father passed away. Because, you know, as there's an expression, as luck would have it, but I think probably a different word than luck belongs there. And whether you believe in God and want to put as God would have it, or whether you believe in nature, or whether you believe in the divine or spirit, I think it's more than luck. My father passed away when I was on a retreat, and we were all going to the beach for a sunrise ceremony. And I was in a dear friend of mine's car, Gogo. And my phone rang. And first of all, it was amazing I had my phone. Second of all, it was amazing I had reception. And I looked and it was my sister. And I was like, of course I'll answer for my sister. And you know, we've got a car full of people. We're all excited. We're, we're almost there. And I pick up the phone and my sister says, this is the phone call you never wanted to get. She told me that my dad had passed away and we were parked by now and so people got out of the car and it was just me and gogo -Go. and she said i will do whatever you want do you want to go to the beach do you want to go back to the camp do you want to go home whatever you want what, what do I, i'm going to do it with you what do you want and i said let's go to the beach so we we walked across the street and all of the people were gathering and we could see them and there was like a uh, Kevin, you might know the actual word. It was like a spit or a jetty of rocks, you know, just this like line of rocks that wide, you know, a couple yards wide that you could walk out on. So we just went walking out on those rocks and we were just crying and sitting and crying and sitting and just saying, I can't believe it. And um, all of the women started walking towards us and the woman who was running the retreat did this beautiful ritual just like off the top of her head. And it was amazing. She would say to all the women gathered, Annie O'Neill, and they would all say, Annie O'Neill. She would say, daughter of Rory O'Neill. And they all said, daughter of Rory O'Neill. And then she would say, you are love. And they would say, you are love. And then she would start it again. Annie O'Neill, daughter of Rory O'Neill, you are peace. Annie O'Neill, daughter of Rory O'Neill, you are love, you are faith, you are compassion, you are goodness. Just, and Gogo and I were just sitting there like all of this washing over us, just like sobbing. And eventually they were done and they walked away and a guy came. Um, uh, I think it's called Paddleboard 
it's like a big surfboard. So he's in a wetsuit and it's dawn. Remember, like the sun is just coming up. And so the, the women are now further down. It's just me and Gogo. And this guy just comes and he puts his paddleboard in the sea and then he just starts paddling. And we just watch him and he gets further and further and further away. And it's just like the Camino. It's just like Burgos. And he finally, he, we can barely see him. And we, we think, God, what he must see when he looks back. Like just, there's nobody around but dolphins and the sun coming up and the waves. And I thought he, what he must see is so beautiful looking back at the coast. And then he keeps going and eventually he's gone. And I think I can't see him anymore, but I know he's still there. And that was from the Camino. And that helped me more than anything, letting go of my dad. I can't see him anymore, but I know he's there. And what he sees is amazing. Annie, wow, um, <laughs> what a way to open our call. What a beautiful story. Um, I think you can kind of see now, clearly, um, why Annie is such a great filmmaker and such a great filmmaker. Um, I just think that you are able to uh, really just give these beautiful, heartfelt examples of the transformation of the Camino and what it's done for all of us. You can put to words what I so badly want to put to words. It's just beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I know. You know, I, I, was, I was telling a friend about that and at the end she was like, is this a movie? <laughs> I was like, no, this happened. <laughs> like, this happened. And, you know, it's a chicken and egg. Like, was I able to see that because of my experience in Burgos? Yeah. Or, you know, like, which came first, the Camino or the, um, did, did I see it because of the Camino or did I see it and then think of the Camino and it, that made me realize, you know, it's just all jumbled up together. But, yeah. you know, those types of lessons, they happen on the Camino. And I actually believe they happen every day, all day, every day, right where we are. Which is, you know, that's my thing, this idea of pilgrimage in place. Like, it's happening now. So we best open our eyes and pay attention. Like, I'm so lucky I had that experience to help me deal with, with my father's death. Because, I, man, I'm a daddy's girl. You know, this was not a fun moment, but I was so much better prepared by the experience in Burgos. So if those things are happening all day, every day, we best get as much out of them as we can because we don't know what's coming next. And all of these lessons will help us. Yeah, that reminds me of Father Cod. I think he talked about how, you know, these miracles are happening every day all around us, you know? All day, every day. All day, every day. But when we're on the Camino, things have slowed down. We, you know, we don't have our phones out as often and we are much more present to the, to the miracles that are happening all around us all the time. And that's one of the things I really love about your book is you talked about, we can do a Camino, well, we're pilgrims for life once we decide we're gonna take the pilgrimage, right? Yeah. But we're also on um, this journey, even when we're back at our homes, no matter where we are. And I think uh, the the pilgrimage in place has really illustrated that um, very vividly, that there are wonders in our own backyard all the time and we can have transformations, whether we're actually on the path on the Camino or on a trail around our house. Yeah, so, yeah it's been really fun. I don't know if everybody here um, goes on pilgrimage in place, but it, it, you know, we're finding out all sorts of history of stuff that you wouldn't have learned about otherwise. You know, we all know the history of the Camino and we know the history of Paris and we know the history and 
London and Big Ben and all that, but you know, we're learning the history in Maine and we're learning the history of a little island off of Dublin. And, you know, you guys are learning the history about my neighborhood and, you know, like I'm fascinated by that because now I want to go to all of those places just as much as I'd like to go back to the Camino. Is it given um, a wonderful chance to visit some other places? Yeah. It's been super nice during the pandemic. I wanted to just uh, say a hi to Michelle who just joined our call. And I know she's on mute, but hi, Michelle, we see you. <laughs> well, we see your, we're your photo. <laughs> In that tunnel. Yeah, she's on, she's on a trip, so she may not uh, be able to do her video right now. But um, Michelle, we'll give you a chance to chime in here in a bit. But I wanted to uh, take a moment to just open up if there are any questions about Annie's book. Um, we'll take questions about our book right now, and then we will move on to uh, Walking the Camino movie. So anyone have a question about her book or the writing process or anything about that? I just had a comment in relation to your last story. One time when we were in Santiago after a Camino, I had the feeling like it was a little bit of a taste of heaven because we've kind of learned to stay around a little bit because people are coming in. And I thought, this is like heaven. You're in this sacred space mm. and people are arriving. And I, I kind of had that little inspiration of, I wonder if this is what being in heaven is like. And you're greeting them and you're excited and they've finished the yeah. journey. And, but anyway, that fit a little bit with what you were saying, I think. So thank you. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true. You know, like imagine like you're in heaven and then one day, you know, Lee shows up and you're happy. You're not going like, Oh, Lee died. You're like, Lee's here, <laughs> you know? And that, that was kind of, that also did happen that mo that morning when we finally came down off the rocks, we went to put our feet in the water. And, um, I just had this experience of my dad's best friend who had passed away years before my dad. And um, I just, it's like I saw his face with the biggest smile on it. And I thought, oh man, Ed Hart is so happy dad's there, you know? And it just, it's like, there's, there's good there. Just like the people leaving Burgos before me, like they were having such adventures and they were seeing such beautiful I can never remember the word in English, paisaje, um, countryside. They were seeing such beautiful countryside. So, you know, and I, I'm not trying to negate there is a heartache and I still can live that with my dad and, and other people, you know, anytime. But, but there's a lot of, um, it's almost like that's just the first layer on understanding these mysteries of life. The first layer is, ouch, I, I don't want that to be true. I, I, I want them here with me. I want to hold. But, um, you know, it, there's more. There's more if we, if we dig. I did want to say one thing. Um, Lee was talking about my book. So I'm going to tell you a little inside joke. There was, <laughs> this, this book has barely been reviewed because I don't really talk about it that much. But there was someone who reviewed it who called it a slender book. And that just cracks me up so much, but I did design this so it fits in your back pocket because I, my thought was <clears throat> like, if Simon goes on the Camino, he'll put this in his back pocket and then one of his loved ones or his circle of friends, they'll all have that and each day they'll all read the same thing and it's a way of staying connected. So I would never wanna to add to Simon's backpack. So this way it's in your back pocket. So it's called a slender little book. So you'll hear like Esther will say sometimes if we're talking about the book, she'll go, and it's a slender book. And that's just to make me laugh. So, so now you guys are in on the joke. I love that. I haven't heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> this slender book that's in your back pocket. All right, so we'll move on to um, Walking the Camino, Six Ways to Santiago. And what, a, I mean, what a great film to start with. And I think it was my second Camino film uh, after watching The Way. And so this was my first documentary of seeing actual pilgrims walking. And of course, I think you're the first pilgrim that we meet in that movie or close to it. 
And I just wondered if you could share with us how that came about. How, how did you get selected to be in the movie and what was the experience like for you? Well, and I hope that's not too loud. Did you guys hear that? Oh, good. Okay. Um, we have helicopters now. Um, <clears throat> so I'm very lucky. I knew the director. It ain't what you know, it's who you know. Um, so I knew the director and she is very smart and she um, had walked the Camino. So she knew that the Camino will provide. So she knew that she could go to Spain and the Camino would provide all of the pilgrims that she would need to interview or could use in her film. But she was also hiring a film crew. She wanted at least one pilgrim in Saint-Jean. So that needed to be prearranged. So I ended up being that pilgrim because I knew her. So wonderful. that was, that was how I, that happened. So did you have a chance to train? Like how much notice did you get before you were actually in Saint-Jean? Nine months, more Nine. or less. So I think it was September and we went in April. So did you train? Did you have any, were you that familiar with the Camino? Oh, I trained so much. <laughs> I didn't train as much up here as I needed to, but I trained. Yeah, I live in Los Angeles and there's a big natural park called Griffith Park. It's where the Griffith Observatory is. And it's, it's great training because I never felt like anything on the Camino was any harder than the hardest parts of Griffith Park. So some of the hills are quite steep. And I was training with a backpack with, I would put a whole bunch of canned goods in there and water and I would use my sticks and I would train. I just, I pushed too hard on the Camino. I was too competitive. So that's why I burned out. The Camino said, no, you can't be competitive here. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I know that John Brierley talks about that first seven days, right? Is that it's those first seven days, if we overdo it, that can really have a strong impact on how the overall Camino journey goes for you. Yeah. I know that Corey had a question in particular about your experience in that movie. I do. I was just going to bring that up. Um, one of my, I'm probably paraphrasing, but one of my favorite uh, statements that you made um, in that movie was when it's a hard day for the ego, it's a good day for the soul or something along the lines. And I remember you talking about people passing you and people, you know, like that it was like a hard, hard thing, but I loved so much how humble you were in realizing that. Cause I think a lot of people would sit and fight and fight that feeling. And I just, and for us to be able to see you and have you mentioned that, and that really spoke to me. Um, cause you know, I see that so much and just everything that I do myself. And I just, I just really loved, loved that, um, statement that you made in there. Oh, thank you. And thank you for reminding me. This is a perfect day for me to hear that. So thank you for saying a bad day for the ego is a good day for the soul. Yeah. Um, that's my pastor, Reverend Michael said that, although my choir director said, well, he heard it from somewhere too. So <laughs> <laughs> so good <laughs> but yeah it's good it's a good thing to remember a bad day for the ego is a good day for the soul because usually it means your things are not going the way you want it and you get if you can step aside enough you can see where you are holding on to something that maybe you shouldn't be holding on to you are resisting you are making life more difficult than it needs to be right so yeah. true. I'm, another one of my favorites was um, your story about the, the German in the albergue that ended up next to you. And then was it, I don't know, was it the next day or days later that ended up carrying your pack for you? Was that? Next day. <laughs> I love it. Hours after I had been like silently <laughs> dissing him. <laughs> you know, everybody has seen the movie, but in case not, could you just kind of give us just a, a quick... <laughs> yeah, well, I was in uh, La Rasuana, and the bunk beds, you know, when you think about bunk beds, you think, well, there's one here, and there's one there, but in La Rasuana, they're like this, 
So like there's this much space in between the two bunks and I end up on a top bunk and there's a guy. So basically I'm going to be sleeping in a bed with a strange man. And I hadn't really planned on that. And I was so afraid that like in the middle of the night, I was just going to turn over and just like snuggle in or something and think it's my husband. And I just was like terrified of what could happen. <laughs> and so I, and, and I love to speak different languages, but I really don't know German. He knew a little English. I knew a teensy tiny um, bit of German. So um, it just, you know, there wasn't much that I could say like, hey, could you make sure <laughs> to stay on your side and not go over the invisible line that separates us? <laughs> like I didn't have enough German for that. And so I just had to go like, all right, well, here goes. And um, so it was awkward. It was uncomfortable. And even my Camino friends, they were like, oh, what's the matter, Annie? You don't want to... I don't know how to make that stop. There we go. Um, they were saying, uh, what's the matter, Annie? You don't want to sleep with some guy who's not your husband? I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> you said it right there. Um, so I kind of was like, ah, oh, why does it have to be you? You know, why couldn't it be a woman? Um, why couldn't, you know, would it be rude if I got up and moved? But, you know, where am I, else am I going to move? There was no other place. And why does this have to be happening? And, uh, and so the next morning I got up like a guilty thief in the night. I got up it was the only time I woke up early and walked when it was dark and immediately got lost. And um, I was like embarrassed to like wake up with this guy. So I just snuck out before anybody was awake and it was dark, I got lost. So I had to just kind of sit down and wait till the sun came up enough for me to see the yellow arrows. Oh, thank you. And, um, and, you know, just was like, oh, thank God that's over. So like those weren't the most kind and loving thoughts to have about this total stranger who was a very nice person, but I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. And then sure enough, later he ends up, I'm just, I can't, I, I was wandering around. I was lost. I was in so much pain, everything hurt. And I hear, oh, the American, and I turn around and it's him. And he just walks right over and just reaches out and he takes my backpack and puts it like over his backpack because he sees that I'm you know, uh, barely hobbling. And now there's like tears running down my face and I'm hobbling behind him. And we get to a, an albergue and everyone's very kind to me there and they get ice for my knees. and. The, the ladies are, um, I think it was Voltaren, um, which I had never heard of Voltaren, but it's, it's a cream that's good for achy joints. And they were like putting it, they were German. They were all putting it on my hands and miming little rub. So I was rubbing my knees and then I, you know, went to do something like this or something. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. And they put my hands under the sink and they washed my hands. Because evidently it's very serious if you ever touch your eyes with that stuff. So it was like they were taking such good care of me. And, and uh, the whole thing was just so humbling. All like this, this guy who I had, couldn't wait to get away from ended up being my hero. That is a beautiful. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Did you see him ever again? Never again. And you know what? I actually have a thought. If I ever went to Germany and met him, I don't even know if he'd remember me. It was that off the cuff for him. It was that, like, it's, it's like, do, if somebody came up to you and said, you held the door for me last year, like, would you remember them? Yeah, because you know, that part, oh, excuse me, that, that part didn't make the film where he took your bag, did it? No, they weren't around. Yeah. I just told the story. 
of him. Yeah. But yeah, it was exactly. so kind. It was so kind. It made me want to be more kind. I, I, I just felt like, have I ever been that kind to someone? Mm. Ever. I didn't ask him to do it. He saw what I needed and just did it. Do I do that? I, you know, I, I try to now. When I see that something is needed, I try and just do it. But I, I don't know if I, and, and you know, I, I actually saw the movie with my friend from high school named Mark. And I said, I don't know if I've ever been that kind. And he was in the audience, so I said, but actually someone who's known me since high school is here, maybe he could answer that question. <laughs> I don't even remember what he said. He probably said, nah. Yeah. Shut up, witch. <laughs> it's so beautiful that he did that at a time when the film crew wasn't around, right? Like there was no glory in that for him. He just simply was really helping you. Yeah, mostly the film crew wasn't around because Lydia had walked the Camino and she knew you have to have a Camino for her to film. And if there's a film crew on you, it changes things. It's just not gonna be the same. And she wanted it to be as authentic as possible. Good point. Yeah, I will open it up if there are any questions about, uh, if you're curious about any of uh, Annie's experiences during the filming of that or during her Camino during it or anything else about the movie. Were you part of any of the editing for that or did you see it for the first time after it was all cut and done? I saw a rough cut and gave notes. So I saw many rough cuts and gave notes, some of which were incorporated, some of which weren't, which is, I mean, the fact that any were incorporated is pretty good, <laughs> you know. A, a director has a vision and an editor has a vision and it's enough juggling those two. So, you know. After that, did you ever envision making a film? Did you say, I, I'd like to make my own film on the Camino? <laughs> Not until I met Phil. <laughs> when I met Phil, that's when I said, I think I could do this. It must be a fantastic experience though to have footage of your actual Camino. You know, so many of us, all we have are photos that we've taken or maybe some videos we took along the way. What's that feel like to you that you can actually go back and see actual footage of that Camino? Yeah, I haven't seen the film in years, but I, um, it is pretty amazing to, to have that. Cause I'm also, I'm, I don't have a lot of photographs from my Camino. Um, when I went, I had a camera and I, I'm kind of a low tech gal. So even a digital camera was like huge for me. I, I was constantly going, what am I doing? <laughs> and, and they ended up on some disc somewhere or something. I don't know where they are. I have a few on my computer because I used some in the book. So in, um, there's a couple of like, like there's a... <clears throat> There's a picture of boots on one page, um, day 28. So that was my picture of boots. And, you know, so there's some things like that. But um, I have maybe a dozen pictures on my computer. So <laughs> that's another reason to do pilgrimage in place. I can just go out and take pictures in my neighborhood. <laughs> there you go. And you're getting quite a collection of other people's Camino pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lot of those. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't revisit stuff a lot. So, you know, when I moved to L.A., I had all of my, I, was, I came as an actress and I had, like, your reel. That was always a thing. Like, you had your reel and all of your stuff was on it. And I gave my reel to my agent and she lost it. She was like, oh, oh well. You know, like she went out of business. I don't know if she lost it, but she went out of business. Everything closed down. Who knows where it ended up? I was like, oh, well, there goes that. I just, I don't know. I don't know if it's a character flaw or it's just, because, you know, when I see people's photographs, I'm like, dang, look at that. I mean, look at even just, you know, look at Michelle's photograph. Right, it's beautiful. It's amazing. That was the other thing. I do remember I figured out how to send a bunch of photographs to my husband um, while I was walking the Camino, maybe like halfway through. 
And he said to me, could you get someone to take the picture? Because all of your pictures are pictures of dogs. <laughs> that was every dog I saw would take a picture. <laughs> so I had mostly pictures of dogs, zero pictures of me, zero. This was before the selfie, you know, there's zero pictures of me. So I had to then start asking people like, oh, could you take my picture in front of this beautiful panorama? And yeah. now I had to have no idea where they even are. Yeah, I had an idea for a coffee book, uh, coffee table book of the dogs of the Camino because I have so many pictures of dogs from my Camino. Uh, anyone else have questions about um, walking the Camino, Six Ways to Santiago? Yeah, Lee, uh, so Simon, yeah. look, uh, not so much, <clears throat> sorry, not so much a question, Annie, but more an observation and uh, I guess from your story with, with the uh, German pilgrim. Uh, I mean, one of the things I found and it, it was people tend to be much more spontaneous in their, um, in the way they work, in the way they interact with fellow pilgrims. You know, that, that sort of caring, sharing, um, people tend to uh, drop their guards a lot more. There's a lot more sharing and openness than you'd have in normal society. And I'm not sure if it's because, it's probably a combination of things, you know, everybody's walking together. We're all sweaty, hot, tired, sore, got blisters. But there's just also seems to be that sort of kindred spirits, you know, kindred souls. And it, it, things like that sort of communal kindness tends to be a lot more spontaneous than I guess in normal day-to-day -day society. There is something about a shared experience, no matter what it is, a shared experience. Um, I have a nephew who's in the Marines and he talks about the, you know, I'm a huge pacifist. So this is my godson. So this has been a process over the last decade of coming to terms with this. And, um, you know, the way he talks about the Marines, we really don't have anything else to offer our young people that's like an experience that he's having, a shared experience, pushing himself physically, working together for something greater than their own lives. And presenting your best self, physically, mentally, you know, they, he's in classes all the time. He's got to learn new things and he's got to, he can't flunk out. You know, you've got to learn new things and do well. So you're always pushing yourself, always pushing yourself. And then you have your dinners or your party time and you're with all of these people who are doing the same thing. And it's just, we don't have anything else like that. So he, there's a lot that's really wonderful about his experience with these other men and women that's really, it's powerful in even his heart. Um, you know, he's, he happens to be a twin and he's probably now 20 pounds. He's got 20 pounds on his twin of all muscle. You know, so like they started out the same. It's like, hmm. but but it's you know it's more than that. It's like this shared experience that he's having. So yeah, that that Camino, you have that shared experience, and that suffering, that difficulty, that when you walk into a place. And, you know, you're doing the Camino shuffle at the end of the day, or you stand up from the dinner table and you're like, uh, uh, Camino shuffle, you know, barely moving. And everybody can go like, oh, yeah, I know I'm going to be like that when I stand up too. It's going to take a little while to get everything moving. Or you walk in and they just look you in the eyes and they go, can I take your bag? Or, so there's a shared experience that's super powerful, that for some reason we've decided we can drop our walls when we share that experience. We've decided that. That's not like written in our DNA or anything. Like we've decided that. And then beautiful things happen. And hopefully that helps to shift us a little bit off of that. And we can be kinder and more open with people when we come back to our homes and our jobs and our circle of friends. There was somebody posted on PIP today, on Pilgrimage in Place today, a beautiful story about uh, this gentleman met a young man 
and he, this guy self-proclaimed the naughtiest boy in Denmark, I think it was. Did you read this, Kevin? Yeah, and, and um, they had a short exchange and this gentleman revealed some things to him that he said even some of his closest friends don't know about him in his past. Then they went their separate ways and sure enough at the end of the day, there's a river and he goes to sit by the river and there's the naughtiest boy in Denmark. And he's, that boy says to him, can I wash your socks for you? And the man says, on one condition, he says, well, what's that? And he goes, let me wash your socks. So there they were washing each other's socks at the end of the day. It's a pretty beautiful thing to do. I don't know if I could walk up to my neighbors right now and say, can I wash your socks? <laughs> and that's my neighbor who I have a friendship with. Imagine like a colleague at work. I don't know if I could say, could I wash your socks? So maybe on the Camino, we have, there are more opportunities to offer a little kindness. Um, but those opportunities exist. We have, to, we have to take them, notice them, you know. I feel like Annie, hearing you say that, that's one of the things I think that kind of pulls us together back to these Camino communities, even once we come home. I know that I find myself often craving the opportunities for those types of connections. You know, if I go to Starbucks, I really want to talk to the people. Well, I used to want to talk to the people around me. I have a <laughs> in, in our old previous life, um, I felt that I was around people a lot in Salt Lake, but I didn't really get to talk to them. And it seems like it's harder in real life sometimes to have those moments of kindness. It really isn't, but it seems like we don't recognize the opportunities uh, for connection or for those little moments of kindness that seem like come so naturally when we're on the Camino. Uh, I yeah, remember it's just a training. You just have to retrain yourself. Yeah. I mean, there is no in real life. Yeah. Like, it, there's no compartment that's real life and then there's something else. <laughs> like, we're just, it's all here. And, and I think the more we can train ourselves away, like, well, on the Camino, it was like this, and now it's like that. If we can say, like, wait, well, wait a second, what if we take those labels off and we just go, I enjoyed washing that person's socks. What could I do today? And when you're at Starbucks, what could you do? I, I don't know. You know, I don't know the answer. Maybe it's like, here's an extra $5 for the next person who comes in towards their order. I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I hate to make it all about money because that's so transactional. And that's one of the beauties of the Camino is that money is such a small part of it. But, um, you know, maybe it's just buying an extra muffin and then taking it to work and just say, hey, I, bought, I don't know why I did this, but I bought an extra blueberry muffin and somebody at work is going to go, I was late. I didn't eat breakfast. Can I have that? You know, we don't know, but we can just keep doing it. I mean, the, one of the reasons I wrote the book was it just seemed crazy to me. I showed the um, Lee and uh, Corey before we started. My neighbor's cat was outside my window. So I flipped the thing around. I'm looking at my front garden. I couldn't possibly count the leaves that I see right now. Even if you gave me a week, I probably couldn't do it. And I live in a city. I don't have, these are not acres. This is like 10 yards or maybe less. Actually, I know it's less. So there's just a lot of leaves there, right? And this is one tiny little parcel in a neighborhood, in a city, in a state, in a country, in a, on a continent. So the thought that the Camino would be the only place that we could experience deep human connections just doesn't add up. Not in this prolific world that Mother Nature, God, Spirit has created for us. To think that there's one place doesn't make any sense. So we're, we're kidding ourselves and maybe we're just keeping ourselves safe. You know, that's what our ego mind wants to do. It wants to keep us safe. Well, it, I did it this way yesterday, so I better do it this way today because I didn't get eaten by anything yesterday. So I know that way is safe. So I'm going to do it the same way today that I did yesterday and the next day, every day the same. But 
you know, if we break out of that and we go like, how could I be kind today? And, you know, and it, it is even more challenging because now we're in masks. You can't necessarily just smile at someone. <laughs> you know, like that's always the go-to. Like if nothing else, I smiled at someone today. Well, now we're wearing masks. <laughs> they don't know if you're smiling or anything. So, how, so it's just like, okay, we just went up a level. That's all. Now it's a little harder. How are we going to do it? How are we going to be kind? How are we going to find ways to connect with people and, you know, Sometimes it's going to work and sometimes you're going to get mocked or worse. People are going to say, I don't like it when you're like that. Okay. No, that's blister. That's all that is. I'm interested, Annie, you mentioned there was a moment when you said, I don't know if I need to do this again. <laughs> and I wonder how many of us have that. We've had that moment. I've had, admittedly, I don't know if I need to do this again. Yeah. Uh, and yet, the Camino experience simmers in our life wherever we are. And there's that point at which you say, I can't not go back. There was a point, Susan said, tell everybody we know, don't let me do this again. <laughs> Love that. And yet it keeps simmering, the experience simmers, and, and it doesn't take long. It, it might have been a plane ride back home, <laughs> but there is a moment at which a lot, of, a lot of us, I think, might have said, I don't know if I need to do it again, and yet we are called to it again. Even while I was on the plane, knowing that I would be, would be walking the Primitivo. I was like, you know, I haven't even been to the continent of Africa. Why am I going back to do something I've basically done before? But that's just all ego. That's just all like, stay safe, do what you did yesterday. So, you know, the Camino has the power to truly transform your life. So that's very threatening. There's going to be changes, shakeups. <clears throat> Did you go back at all for the, any of the filming for Phil's Camino? Were you no. there for that? No, I was on tour with Walking the Camino. So I had committed to that. And when Phil got an okay to go to Spain, everything happened very quickly. So, you know, I couldn't say, could you postpone like six months? Let me really produce this. <laughs> it's like, no, he's going. So that just happened really fast. How did that feel? Not, I mean, did you feel like you weren't totally in control then? And, you know, oh, I mean, so see what they were up to. Yeah, I mean, I loved being on tour with Walking the Camino. It was really fun, really great. We had an RV and my dear friends, I had two dear friends with me and we were just traveling in an RV. <laughs> it was great. But um, it was so hard sending a crew off to do what I wanted to do. That was really hard. So. And I wondered, um, the couple in um, Walking the Camino Six Ways to Santiago, are they still together, do you know? They're not, they're not. They, they were together for a while. I know, it's like, why do we want that? <laughs> but we do, but I knew William, so I didn't want it that much, but, <laughs> but you know, you want a happy ending. Yeah, exactly. Um, you want what you think is a happy ending. And, you know, I think it's difficult for Misa to, to watch the film and to, you know, I, I just imagine. I actually haven't ever asked her about it, but I would, I would imagine. I, I, I was just going to say at the end, uh, in the credits for walking, they mentioned Martin Sheen. And I was wondering what role did, did he have a direct role or was it just the impact of, you know, the previous movie? Well, that's a great question. I, I'm going to answer it as best I can. Um, he, uh, so they were supposed to film around the same time we were filming, but their production got pushed back. So they, we shot in the spring, they shot in the fall. So when 
Lydia got back, she immediately got her direct, her editor to put together a 22 minute fundraising clip. So we could show this to people and go like, look, if you give us money, it'll, it'll be more of this. It'll be a feature length film of this. And Emilio Estevez showed his cast and crew that 22 minute clip so they could get an idea of how difficult it is. So there was that connection. And then um, Martin and Amelia were speaking in Washington, D.C., and Lydia was there, and she stood up to ask a question. And during that time, Martin said, oh, my God, this is the director of a new film that's coming out, and it's spectacular, or whatever it is that the, the quote was that ended up on all of the material. <laughs> you know, it... It happened, he said it, so they put it on as a quote. And, uh, you know, having one of the biggest movie stars in the world say that is pretty great. So I think that's what the thank you was for. Good question, Kurt. Oh, I wanted to move on to Phil's Camino. Wanted to make sure, oh, there's Michelle. We see her lovely face. <laughs> uh, I, Annie, do you want to introduce it or do you want me to show the trailer first? Just show the trailer. All right, so. I wrote a message on Facebook. All of a sudden I realized there was like one more line. There's a certain amount of characters that they gave me. Right now in my life, that's, that's where it's at. I got like one more line. I gotta put it in there. I got one more chance. When I found out about the cancer, I was obviously never thought you would think about or never wanted to think about. You know, we just go, oh, that's not gonna happen to me. You know, you get the, the big C, you know, coming to realize it doesn't mean that you have to sort of accept all that fear. Keep walking, Phil. Don't stop. Okay, so I feel like I have to apologize for the quality of that. <laughs> I don't know quite why that was jumpy like that, but yeah. But if you go to, uh, you can see it on YouTube, you can see it on Vimeo, the um, trailer, it's a lot smoother. Can I just say that that was so incredible? And I mean, I cried throughout most of the entire film, but when he washed his friend's feet, I honestly, just even talking about it now, it breaks my soul open. I could not even breathe. Like I just, that was everything to me to watch him do that and to see their reaction. You did an amazing job with that whole thing. So I just wanted to tell you that I just, it really touched me. I can't even talk about it without crying. It was, it was amazing. It was remarkable. So thank you for that. That's my favorite scene. That's my favorite scene in the film. And that's in the longer version. You know, the shorter version, we were just trying, I, I wanted to make like a 10 or 15 minute film. And the reason I wanted to do that was it's cheaper. It usually takes less time. And I have this guy with stage four cancer. And um, it's easier to get it accepted in film festivals if it's 10 or 15 minutes. So um, we were really just trying and trying and trying to make the shortest film we could. We ended up with a, basically a 30 minute film, um, 28 minutes, but we were trying to always cut. And so when it came time to cut that scene, oh, 
it was just killing me. So I was with Doug Blush, my um, executive producer and supervising editor, and he's worked on 20 Feet from Stardom. He's worked on the, the um, he's worked on so many huge films that I'm, name any documentaries that have been nominated for Academy Awards. He worked on Period End of Sentence, that one for Best Short last year. So, you know, he's got a ton of experience and, you know, he was saying that we had to take out that scene. So I came to that meeting really prepared and I was like, well, you know, here's, here's what I think and here's why it should stay in. And I laid out all of my reasons and Doug was sitting across the table from me and he was kind of going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, this is working. I'm winning. Like he's gonna, he's seeing it my way. And at the end he goes, yeah, well, I've only done about 75 of these, so maybe you're right. And I was just like, oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, bye. Bye, fun watching scene. So it was just another reason to kind of put it back in, to, to make the longer version, which meant that we had to go into the film again. We had to pay for more music. We had to pay another editor. We had to pay, 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 pay. But the foot washing scene, got in there. So that's in the longer version. Phil's Camino so far so good. It was so good. I love it. I love that scene so much. <laughs> I know. Lee, I think you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Annie, I wondered if you could kind of tell the story of how you met Phil and how the movie even came into being. Yeah. So Phil, um, and his lovely wife, Rebecca, live in the Seattle area. And walking the Camino was there, was up there. The, the deal that all of the art house theaters made was we'll show it for a week. And then if it does well, we'll extend. And um, so it was like, all right. And they almost all extended. And Seattle, it was extended for 11 weeks. So, I wrote something on the Facebook page, just like, thank you, Seattle. Like, this is amazing. And I want to get up there and do a Q&A with everybody. And Rebecca reached out to me and she said, my husband has stage four cancer and he loved this film so much. And then she like started a sentence and she must have pressed return. And so it went up. So then she came back and she said, what I meant to say was, and she started, and then like halfway through a word, she must have pressed return again. <laughs> so like there were all these like snippets and none of them were full ideas. And finally she said, oh, forget it. <laughs> and she just put that up and I was like, forget it. No, no, <laughs> like you, you told me some really amazing stuff. Let's figure this out. <clears throat> so then, um, we ended up being Facebook friends. And then at one point I got a private message and she said, this is Rebecca. My husband doesn't do Facebook, but he wanted to tell you something. So then Phil was like, hey, I don't know what Rebecca's told you about my deal here, but we've got 10 acres and I made my own Camino. I can't travel right now, so I made my own Camino. And at first I was trying to conquer the Camino, but now I'm just happy to be walking it. And I thought, well, boy, that sounds like my journey too. You know, I was trying to conquer the Camino. I was trying like, I'm going to be the strong American woman who's going to go. And then I just was like grateful for every step <laughs> till I, you know, that I wasn't falling down. And, um, and he said, my priest came and blessed it. So it's kosher. And <laughs> it just was like, he just was pure fell, you know, and it was, He's a charming guy. So I was, and he said, come walk with me. Love, Phil. And I was just like, who is this guy? I want to go walk with him. And so I did. I went and walked with him. And as I was walking, I thought, oh, it's too bad. My, my husband can't ride a boat. It's, he has an inner ear thing. So he took me to the ferry because to get to Phil, you have to take a ferry. So he took me to the ferry and then we made plans for when he'd pick me up and I took the ferry. And it wasn't until I was on the ferry that I went, 
wonder if this guy's a serial killer, you know, like, I wonder if this is it, you know, I'm going to end up in a hefty trash bag in a freezer somewhere. And like, I didn't know the guy's address. I didn't know his phone number. I was just getting picked up by someone in a red hat. That's all I knew. So, you know, I, but I, I realized like, that's a long way to go to murder someone. Like there's, if someone's a serial murderer, they're going to choose an easier target, right? They're not going to lure someone up from Los, Los Angeles. And so anyway, I worked through that on the ferry and um, <laughs> there he was, this guy in a pickup truck and a red hat. So I get in the truck and we go to his house. And as we're there, I thought, I wish my husband was here because it would be cool to film this. And I didn't want to whip out my phone. I wanted to just be talking to him. But I thought, like, that's, this is an incredible story. And sure enough, as after I left, we continued to be in touch with one another and I eventually wore him down because <laughs> I started to say things like, you know, Phil, I think I could make a good little film about you. And he would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just a guy walking in the mud. There's no story here. And I was like, well, I, I think there is, you know, you got to trust me on this one. I think there is a, a pretty cool story here. And it wasn't until his doctor said he could go to Spain that he agreed. And I think he thought that was the story. And for me, Spain was never the story. It was all about his backyard. So, but I was very happy because it got him to say yes. And just like, you know, he basically lives in a rainforest and he was going to Spain in July and August, which is gonna be like a color drenched, sunshine filled wonderland, you know? So it was, I knew that visually this was gonna be so interesting. And story-wise it's a, it's a great story, but I think the bigger story really is in his backyard. I know you've mentioned, Annie, uh, how many people have actually walked Phil's Camino with him at his house? I think he stopped counting at 300, but I think so, and that was a few years ago, so I think we can safely say over 400. And he did close it for the, um, when when Seattle and when Washington State closed down, he closed his Camino down. And he has since opened it because it can be outdoors and it, that you can be socially distant when you walk it. But it used to be that if you went and walked with Phil, you would end up at his picnic table eating tapas. But that he's not doing that until it gets a little safer. I wanted to give everyone a chance if anyone has a question about Phil's Camino. Please unmute and ask away. Uh, while you're thinking about that, I, I do have a couple of other questions, uh, Annie. Uh, how has, since you've met Phil, how, how has knowing him transformed your life? And also, uh, I know on another call, I've heard you mention some of the things that you've witnessed on tour with Phil. Uh, where he has touched other people's lives as well. And I just wondered if you, if you would mind sharing a couple of those things. Well, you know, Phil is exactly what you see in the film. He's exactly that guy. So he's that guy after the film, before the film. And, you know, before this started, I was telling me and Corey about uh, interviewing Sonia Choquette and you know, I started her interview by saying, I feel, I read your book, I feel like I know you. And she said, you do. And it was funny to me because people say that to me a lot. They go, oh, I saw your film, I feel like I know you. And I'm like, you do, that, that was exactly me. And they were like, well, aren't you an actress? It's like, if I could have acted better, I would have. I wouldn't have been crying and, you know, I would have acted better, but I, that was me. Um, so, you know, Phil is very present. And I think that's the other thing. A lot of artifice falls away on the Camino because everybody's wearing the same clothes every day. Nobody looks any better or worse than anybody else. Although I will say Tatiana, the French woman in Walking the Camino, she bought a new, um, like a new top halfway through the Camino. And it, oh, 
I was like, dang, she's like a rock star. Like she looks like a model, you know, cause it was like a cotton top and it was clean. And it was like, she's just like thrown everybody's game way off. Like she looked so different because she had on a new shirt that wasn't really a hiking shirt. It was like a cute little top. I was like, man, that's so weird that, you know, one simple article of clothing, and if she showed up wearing it, you would never would think twice and look at it twice. But on the Camino, it was white. It was white with a little bit of blue. And it was like, who wears white? <laughs> it's gonna be clean for half a day at most. But you know, she looked really good. Okay, that was a tangent. Anybody who can remind me who you were before what? that? I was, yeah, no, it's a great story. Um, you know, I was just wondering, you have mentioned while you were on tour with the film, um, the yeah. film touched Phil, people's lives. Yeah, so Phil is just so authentically his. So we, we premiered the film in, um, at South by Southwest, which for a filmmaker, there's three film festivals that are the top that you basically never think you're going to get in. And it's Sundance, Tribeca, and South by Southwest. And, you know, it's like the holy grail. So we didn't get into Sundance. I don't think I even submitted to Tribeca because it's very edgy and, and, and so is Sundance, but I just knew we wouldn't get in. And um, I got the phone call that we got into South by, and it was just amazing. Um, and um, Phil by this time was, um, he had started his blog, Phil has a blog, and he had made friends with this guy that we all call Pilgrim Farmer John, who lives in, um, he lives in, uh, he's a corn farmer, where does he live? Iowa. So Pilgrim Farmer John was a Marine, Phil was a Marine. Phil grows corn, Pilgrim Farmer John farms corn, you know, so they had all of these things in common and Pilgrim Farmer John is also a wonderful person. So they had really hit it off. So I first call was to Doug to tell him like, we got into South by, oh my God. And uh, then I called Phil. Now Phil doesn't know anything about film festivals. So I was like, Phil, I have really big news we got into South by Southwest. It's amazing. He goes, oh, really? I said, yeah, this is a film festival that everybody wants to go to. This is such great news. I'm so happy. He goes, oh, do you think there are any film festivals in Iowa? Because <laughs> he wanted to go to Iowa. So I was like, okay, Phil, I'll check it out. I'll see. Because <laughs> I told him he was going to be coming to South by. So, um, so we get to South by and the theater I think holds 600 people and it was standing room only and after you know it, so Phil's Camino the original film is 28 minutes so it's called a short so it's in a block of a bunch of short films that makes up about two hours and afterwards they invite all of the filmmakers to go up and answer questions so we're all up there and Felipe comes up with me on stage and as soon as he walks on stage just everybody's just applauding again to see him in real life. And so, you know, there's a question to this film and there's a question to that film. And then this woman gets up and she wants to talk to Phil. And she said, I just came from hospice. My best friend has cancer and I'm trying to say goodbye to her. And she was just weeping and she was just talking about the film. And Phil just turned from the stage walked to the edge, walked down the stairs, walked over to where she was on the microphone and just put his arms around her. So she just wept into his shoulder. And that was our first, that was our first screen. <laughs> that was the very first one. And I did find a film festival in Iowa. So I submitted, we got accepted, and I arranged for Phil and I to both fly there. And Pilgrim Farmer John arranged for us to be met at the theater 
by a Marine welcome. So he called the local recruiting office and had a Marine welcome there for us. So when we came up, there was somebody in his dress blues there to salute Phil and John was also with us and the local media was there and that also was a really amazing. What a special opportunity, uh, Anna, you've had to um, travel with Phil and get to know him so well. And mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you for the whole Camino community of introducing Phil to all of us. Um, it's just a remarkable story and you did such a beautiful job bringing it to film and knowing his story is just such an inspiration. And if you haven't seen the film yet, I highly encourage you to. Um, I have the link on our Facebook page so you can find it there. It's, you won't be disappointed. It's just a, a brilliant story, a brilliant story to begin with and so beautifully told by you, Annie. Just so appreciate it. And, you know, I spent, let's see, it's 2020 now. I made it in 2016. I tried to show it as many places and as many times as possible and always for free. You know, I just wanted people to see it because I really love the message and I, I didn't ever want anybody to think, well, I can't afford a ticket, so I'm not going to go see it. So we just, we showed it at every church I could find, you know, community rooms, basements of churches. We just showed it wherever we could. Um, and I just started charging for it. So I put it on Vimeo. But if there's ever someone who that would be difficult for them, please just shoot me an email or, you know, find me on Facebook or something. I'm happy to share it with people. Um, I, I do still sell the DVD. Simon, you're in Australia, right? Did you just order it? No, no, it wasn't me. But I haven't seen it, so I'm actually, I, I probably will order it, but I, it wasn't me. <laughs> I know that's like, you get on the Camino and people go, oh, you're American. Do you know my friend in, you know, Louisiana? <laughs> it's a bit like that. Actually, no. Um, but I just thought, wouldn't that be weird? But uh, I'm actually trying to find, because the, the postage overseas is like $14. So I always try and find like as many like people from that country as possible. I'm like, hey, does one of you want to like take ownership of like getting it to your friends, one, you know, your countrymen once it's in your country? Your country. <laughs> which, which city is it going to in, in Australia? I can look it up. I can look it up. <laughs> that would have been great if that had been you, Simon. <laughs> it would have been. It would have been a very small world indeed. <laughs> well, wouldn't it be funny if you knew the person when I say their name? <laughs> well, while you're looking for that, Annie, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that we have our next call planned, and that's actually going to be on a Saturday, and it is going to be with um, Bradley Chimworth, and he does the um, Camino de Santiago uh, Pilgrims podcast, and so he has done so many different podcasts. He has interviewed some fascinating people, and I think he's going to be a just so interesting to hear uh, on a call. So if you can join us, that's going to be on Saturday, July 18th, noontime, uh, mountain time. So do your converter. I, Corey and I, we talk constantly about what time is that and whatever zone. And so <laughs> I didn't even get in to try to say all the different times. But anyway, that will be July 18th on a Saturday because that was the best day. Uh, he is based in, um, oh, off the coast of Spain, I can't think of the name right now. But anyway, you see the Canary Islands, was it? Yes, thank you. Oh, wow, so that's gonna be so fun. He wrote a book, uh, "The Only Way Is West," and he has been also uh, he has also done several Caminos, and uh, the podcast is really good. So if you get a chance to check out his podcast before that Saturday, um, maybe you'll have a few questions for him. So. I know that we have probably taken so much of your time today, Annie, but you're always so fascinating to listen to. <laughs> well, I'm like John oh, Burry. I, I stretched out like two and a half hours for this. Um, but I, I, I always forget to do my own promotions and stuff, but we do have a really good group of people in Pilgrimage in Place. 
So if you're on Facebook, just come over, you can join. I just think joining makes it easy because then I don't really have to find you. <laughs> I can just put it on pilgrimage in place and you can decide if you wanna to come to, we call them pilgrim tables, our Zoom calls. And we have, we read books together or see movies together. Last week we had the guys from I'll Push You and they were our guests. And this Saturday is a woman who wrote a book called Finding Mercy in This World, which is a beautiful book. And next weekend, well, July 18th, that same day, you could do it because my calls are around your calls. Uh, we have Johnny Walker Santiago, who is a real just delightful pilgrim who runs the Camino. Oh, I forget what his Facebook group is called, but something like the Pilgrims Discussion Group. It's a really big one. And he's a lovely human being and lives in Santiago. And so he wrote a book called It's About Time. And we're reading that book. And then the following week, we're reading um, Your Choice of Two Books by B.B. Barami, who's a travel writer and an anthropologist. And she writes about the sacred spaces, the sacred sites along the Camino. It's really interesting and a lot of history. And then July 11th, we're having a, I've been talking to Kevin about this. I, I've been calling it a panel, but it's just one person. <laughs> so technically it's probably not a panel. I, I just wanna think, I wanna emphasize that it's really a special deal. She has not written a book, but she has a really interesting story of walking the Camino in memory of her daughter who was murdered. And her sister did make a short film about it. So we'll play that just like um, Lee just did. We'll share the screen and we'll watch it together and then um, talk with Sunika about what that journey has been like and how it has motivated her to make a nonprofit organization for other mothers of murdered children to walk the Camino as part of their healing. So it's a beautiful story. She's a wonderful person. And, um, and then there's one more surprise, but I can't say what that is yet. But So as, as, as you guys can tell, those Saturday calls are just absolutely okay. fantastic. And mm -hmm. uh, what time are they again, Annie? I know what time I get on, but what time? 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. Pacific time. So 12 noon New York time, 6 p.m. New York time. And they end up being 8, the 3 p.m. for me call is 8 a.m. in Australia. And people always say such lovely things. I'm like, well, oh, this is my Sunday morning church. <laughs> I love to try. Pilgrim table. Yeah. So it's really nice. And if you uh, have, if you haven't seen the other ones that have already occurred, the videos are posted on the. Oh, yeah. So we had John Brerley. We so had good. the guys from I'll Push You. We had Dave Whitson, who does the Camino podcast, who it was, I think, his first time being interviewed because he's such yep. a great interviewer. We had two pilgrims who had walked the Camino and the 88 temples in Japan. And now I'm forgetting. Oh, Steve Watkins, Kevin Codd. We've had really beautiful, beautiful pilgrims. Oh. And Phil, yeah, we had Phil. Oh, that's right. So when we have Johnny Walker on, it's going to be the 9 a.m. on the 18th. And then the 3 p.m. will be Phil because that's too late for Johnny Walker. Oh, we had Rebecca Scott with Furnace Full of God. So they're just, and they're all on there. And everything's free. It's just, this is just our community. You know, this is just being together. So invite people that you think could use some good energy. You know, at my church, they talk about everything is energy. Everything is energy. So this is, I wanted to make a little good energy location <laughs> factory. <laughs> so we can all just like, there's a lot of bad energy and we can balance it and then we can go back fortified. No, Andy, you certainly have done that with Pilgrimage in Place and with your body of work. And I think everybody tonight has seen your beautiful energy and everything that you're bringing to the Camino community. So thank you for taking time out and talking to us tonight. We love hearing your stories and uh, really appreciate the work that you do. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And so July 18th, thank you, Annie. July 18th you've got three calls to be on. You've got the morning. Uh, with, <laughs> right? That's a lot. 
at noon <laughs> and then fiddle again uh, in the afternoon. So I hope to see all of you there at all three. Thank you so much for being a part of the uh, Camino Cafe community as well. And I hope that you'll pop over to Pilgrimage and Play and become a part of that too. We can't get enough of the Camino, so. I know. <laughs> it's fun to get a lot of the Camino. Exactly. So if everybody wants to unmute and just say a bon Camino and uh, say goodbye to Annie. Thank you so much. And I will post, we've talked bon about Camino. Bon Camino. We have uh, links <laughs> to the Facebook page. So thank you so much. Bon Camino. Yes. Everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bon Camino. Bon Camino. Bon Camino. Bon Camino, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Delightful. Yes. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs>